Okay, uh, good uh, morning everybody to this uh, workshop uh, webinar, um, Tactility. So, uh, natural electrotactile feedback for immersive virtual reality. Um, we have uh, today uh, three main speakers. So, this will be Strahinia Dozen, Ferran Argelanger, and uh, Martin Witteveen. Uh, all uh, collaborators in this uh, tactility project that is a Euro European funded Horizon 2020 project. So today's uh, webinar outline is um, uh, the, divided in three parts. So we have uh, the first part uh, presented by Strahinia Dozen from Aalborg University about electrotactile stimulation to provide feedback. Then the second part um, is presented by Ferran Argelage from Indria, France uh, about uh, virtual reality interactions. And the third part will be presented by Martin Wetterwien from Manus VR um, in the Netherlands uh, about uh, a multi-finger demonstration in a virtual environment. And then we will leave uh, five to ten minutes uh, for questions and answers. So when you have questions, uh, uh, specific questions, please use the chat and then you can enter there the questions so we can collect a number of questions that we can go through in a moderated way. We will also enable at the end that you can directly pose orally the questions in case that this works uh, well. So, but uh, please uh, be invited to formulate your questions uh, through that uh, uh, chat that you have uh, in the in the system. So with this, uh, I would uh, start with the first part and I uh, switch to uh, Strahinia Dozen to um, provide, uh, to, to give his first part of the presentation. Strahinia, did you uh, receive access? Yes, I, I did, yeah. I did. Okay, perfect. Do you see my presentation? Yes, we can see your presentation. Is the is the sound also okay? The sound is fine. We okay. are all set. Very good. Okay, perfect. So then I will uh, start uh, presenting. And uh, uh, please, uh, Thierry, if uh, the sound uh, becomes bad or if uh, you know there is a problem in in the video just uh, uh, let me know so that uh, you know i can make a break and then hopefully the connection will will improve uh, yes, but uh, i'm moment. very glad okay. excellent uh, i'm very glad that uh, i have the opportunity to present uh, on this uh, nice uh, webinar uh, where we will actually uh, present uh, some of the results uh, from uh, the project uh, tactility which is a European project with an ambitious task. And this uh, task is to enhance uh, virtual reality interaction uh, and also augmented uh, reality with uh, the sense of touch. Uh, because uh, as uh, everyone knows, uh, VR and uh, AR technologies are uh, somehow uh, become more and more common and pervasive, and uh, they have applications in many different uh, contexts. And uh, they can create immersive experience, uh, which means that you have this uh, very nice uh, visual and uh, auditory feedback uh, that uh, creates an impression of uh, you being in the place, uh, in another world, virtual world. However, uh, there is no uh, tactile sense. So touch is still missing uh, from the virtual reality largely. And uh, this uh, step also would uh, improve this overall feeling of uh, immersion. So if uh, there is a tactile feedback in virtual reality, then uh, you could basically feel those uh, virtual uh, virtual objects uh, in addition to uh, only seeing them uh, or, or hearing them. So one of the uh, crucial critical technologies that uh, we use in tactility is uh, electrotactile stimulation to elicit uh, those uh, sensations. And uh, in this uh, short uh, presentation, I will uh, speak about uh, that uh, approach. I'm coming uh, from uh, Aalborg University. Uh, Aalborg University is a partner in a tactility project 
and uh, we are coming uh, from far north uh, from uh, Denmark and then if you actually look into Denmark uh, then you should go even north of Denmark uh, and uh, close to the tip as you can see on the map in the left uh, there is a place called Aalborg uh, where we have this uh, Aalborg University and I'm coming from the Department of uh, Health Science and Technology uh, uh, where I'm leading a group uh, for uh, neuro uh, rehabilitation systems. Uh, so we are dealing a lot uh, with uh, humans, uh, human uh, neuroscience, uh, motor control, and uh, in general we are developing uh, systems uh, that uh, interface uh, with humans uh, for different purposes. For example, assistive systems, systems that provide feedback, uh, restore motion, and, and so on. Uh, and obviously, uh, if we uh, speak about or think about providing tactile feedback uh, to a human subject, then uh, we have to start uh, from understanding of uh, human tactile perception. And uh, in this uh, slide, uh, I will just provide uh, a very brief and therefore also simplistic uh, overview of uh, human uh, tactile neurophysiology. I will just underline some, some basic aspects uh, that uh, are important for our work. Uh, as you can see here, uh, actually human tactile sense, as uh, you can imagine, is quite sophisticated. Uh, we have different uh, type of receptors, and here you can see four uh, characteristic uh, type of uh, mechanoreceptors of uh, humans that are embedded in the skin. Uh, they are embedded in the skin at uh, different depths, uh, more superficially and uh, also deeper. And uh, this uh, depth uh, where the receptor is uh, determines uh, the, the receptive field and uh, therefore the spatial resolution uh, associated uh, to a particular receptor. And obviously these receptors uh, are concentrated in a dense network uh, that uh, goes around the fingertip. Now, another aspect uh, that uh, you can notice is that uh, uh, these uh, receptors, uh, they also have different uh, morphology. Uh, they have different uh, shape and size, uh, for example, here and uh, here. This is not by chance, uh, this is actually an important, uh, an important requirement uh, for uh, human mechanical receptors. Uh, where uh, they are sensitive to completely different aspects of uh, mechanical stimulus that is applied uh, to the skin. Uh, so, for example, uh, Merkel cells, uh, they register the magnitude of the stimulus, uh, so constant uh, pressure. Uh, then uh, Meissner corpuscula will uh, register the velocity or the rate of change of this pressure, while uh, Pacinian uh, corpuscula uh, will actually sense uh, acceleration or uh, vibrations, actually. And finally, uh, Ruffini endings, uh, they are sensitive to skin stretch. So you see this sophistication of the human tactile sense where different receptors will actually react differently to the same input uh, into the skin. And this is what uh, provides uh, or generates a richness of, of human perception. Now, uh, this also uh, gives us a, a nice introduction in, into how we can stimulate uh, the, the, the skin or how we can stimulate the human body and elicit uh, tactile sensations. Of course, we can do that mechanically, and this is a very flexible approach because uh, by delivering different uh, mechanical stimuli, we can actually preferentially activate these receptor types. For example, uh, this uh, device uh, that you can see on the left uh, is actually uh, applying uh, this uh, pushing uh, uh, stimuli. Uh, it pushes with this plate into the fingertip. So uh, basically we can activate those receptors uh, that uh, register uh, constant uh, pressure, right? While uh, this interesting device uh, that uh, also comes uh, on the top of the fingertip has uh, two electric uh, motors that uh, you can see here and here, and then there is a band wrapping around the fingertip. So if these uh, two electric motors are rotating in uh, different directions, then uh, they will tighten the band. And again, you have this pushing sensation or pushing stimulation. But if they start rotating uh, in different directions, then basically this band will slide tangentially uh, on the skin of the fingertip, and uh, this will uh, then stimulate these uh, Ruffini receptors uh, because it's going to be the stretch of the skin that is activated. And uh, finally, in this uh, last example, uh, you have uh, miniature vibration motors. Uh, obviously, they can uh, generate vibrations, and this is something that we all know from mobile phones. And these vibrations, if they have a particular frequency, they can actually activate these uh, Parchinian uh, corpuscules. So by developing different mechanical systems, mechatronic systems, we can actually activate preferentially some of these receptor types, and then uh, we can also elicit the particular sensations. But this is not the only uh, method, and this actually brings us uh, to the technology, which is uh, crucial for tactility. Uh, we can also stimulate the skin electrically. And uh, this is a very simple approach. Uh, actually, 
the thing that you need to do is uh, to place an electrode. This is uh, just um, a schematic of the electrode on the skin. And then uh, you deliver electrical pulses through this electrode. The electrical pulses, uh, they go inside the skin and then uh, they activate the nerve that innervates the receptor. And this is an important difference between electrical stimulation and mechanical stimulation because in electrical stimulation, you're not activating receptor directly like mechanical stimulation, but uh, you activate the nerve. And that also means that electrotactile stimulation, how we call it in this context, is a non-specific, which means that we cannot select receptors that we would like to activate, but we activate whatever is below the electrode uh, when we place it. On the other side, we also have a very nice uh, flexibility with electrotactile stimulation because these electrical pulses that are coming into the skin, they have some parameters. And then by modulating those parameters, we can uh, adjust uh, the quality and the quantity of sensation that we elicit in a very nice and simple way. For example, if uh, we uh, increase the amplitude or the duration of the pulse, so this is a train of pulses, right? If we increase the amplitude or duration of the pulse, then uh, we can increase the intensity of elicited tactile sensation. And if uh, we increase uh, the rate of these pulses, the frequency, then uh, we can start uh, from a single uh, tactile sensation. So if I deliver you a single pulse, you will feel like someone touched your finger, for example. If I then increase the frequency of pulses and deliver multiple pulses, then uh, you will feel sequence of tactile sensations. And finally, if I increase frequency even more, then this sequence will fuse into vibration, flutter, and finally constant pressure. So by changing those parameters, which is very simple if you have an electronic stimulator, uh, then uh, we can uh, grade and, and adjust the quality and quantity of these sensations. So uh, what are the advantages of this uh, electrotactile approach? So if you compare these electrotactile devices uh, shown at the beginning, uh, which are kind of variable and they're also very small, uh, we can see actually that uh, mechanical, that electrotactile stimulation has no mechanical parts. So uh, it's a more compact and a simpler design. And uh, electrotactile stimulation allows fast response. Since there are no mechanical parts, there are no inertias that you need to move and speed up in order to deliver sensation. Then it's also low power, again, because it's uh, just an electrical pulse of a uh, uh, very uh, low amplitude and, and also very short uh, duration. Uh, because of these characteristics, uh, we can make uh, electrotactile interfaces which are very compact and they can be customized. And on the right, in fact, uh, you see many of these uh, electrotactile and, and uh, electrical stimulation electrodes. Uh, they can be printed in different uh, sizes, different shapes. They can be larger if applied to the body. They can be smaller, as you will see if uh, you want to apply them on the fingertip or on the hand. So it's quite convenient uh, to actually deliver this uh, multi-channel and even high density stimulation, which uh, could be difficult uh, to achieve uh, with uh, these mechanical uh, technologies that I have uh, shown uh, initially. On the other side, uh, we also have to admit uh, that uh, there are some challenges in applying electrotactile stimulation. And this is also what uh, makes uh, our project uh, uh, challenging and, and interesting. Uh, the sensation can be location dependent. So depending on where you place the electrode, uh, you can actually get different sensation because uh, of the electrical properties uh, of the tissue that are different. And also, if you apply sensation or, or current, electrical current, which is too high, then uh, this can some, sometimes lead uh, to a discomfort, right? But uh, if uh, you adjust uh, the parameters properly, uh, which is actually not difficult, then uh, you can get a nice and comfortable uh, sensation and you can adjust it, as I just explained in the, in the previous slide. So now, just to illustrate a little bit the potential of electrotactile stimulation, uh, and what it can do uh, to provide you a little bit of a perspective, a broader perspective, uh, I decided to go a bit in the past because it's always nice uh, to show a bit of history, right? And here you can see it's a, it's a very old uh, study, very old uh, device, uh, 40 years uh, ago that was developed. Uh, but actually in this, in, in this case, uh, quite impressively, electrotactile stimulation is used uh, to provide visual information uh, to a blind person. So here you have a blind person and then there is a camera next to these glasses and uh, the visual image is uh, then uh, transformed into a sequence of electrical pulses. And these electrical pulses are delivered through these high density electrodes. You see these uh, pins, it's a little bit difficult to see in this uh, picture, but those are all uh, pins, metal pins, electrodes, 
that uh, stimulate the back of the patient. And this is an elect experimental proto prototype where you sit in the chair, but then uh, very similar electrodes uh, can be placed below this uh, belt uh, on, the, on the body of the, of the subject. So this is just uh, to show that tactile sense has a lot of bandwidth. So you can transmit a lot of uh, rich information through the tactile sense. And this is what we see as our main opportunity when thinking about uh, feedback in, in virtual reality. And uh, on the right, uh, you see a more contemporary example. This is a brain port uh, system. It's the same uh, application to substitute uh, the lost uh, visual uh, sense. But in this case, uh, this is the electrode and this electrode goes into the mouth to stimulate the tongue, right? And uh, the tongue is also quite sensitive place that you can use to uh, provide uh, information. And then just an illustration, what is actually happening here, you take a picture, then you pixelize the picture, as you can see here, and this pixelated picture then is transmitted through electrodes. The electrodes here are like tactile pixels. We can call them taxels uh, for, for this specific application. So this is to uh, emphasize the potential, the, the intrinsic potential in this, in this technology. But then uh, we catapult uh, ourselves in the present, and then uh, this is more contemporary example. Uh, on the left, uh, you see a, a, a Tesla suit. Uh, that's actually an interface uh, that uh, incorporates uh, many uh, electrical uh, uh, pads uh, or electrodes. And these electrodes uh, that uh, you can see here as uh, indicated by a blue circle, they are spread all around the body to provide full body feedback, tactile feedback using electrical stimulation. And uh, this uh, feedback uh, is, as you can see, for the application in virtual reality. Now, in this particular case, uh, the electrodes are rather large, right? Because uh, they are for the different body parts. While in tactility, our focus is to provide high density feedback through the glove uh, to the hand and also the fingers. So uh, we, this is the focus of the, of, the, of the project. We focus on the hand and the fingers and then density station uh, through the tactility interface. And obviously, uh, since uh, you could see a couple of examples uh, before that stimulation can be provided on the back, then also it can be provided on the tongue or uh, all around the body. But uh, for us, uh, it's the finger, which is the target and the hand as well. So uh, in tactility project, uh, we started by uh, trying to answer some fundamental questions. Uh, and this is uh, how well you can localize stimulation uh, electrotactile stimulation when it is delivered on the finger. Then uh, how well you can discriminate uh, between different electrode pads. Let's say that uh, we place 15 electrode pads on the finger. Can you actually recognize the difference between them? What is the resolution that uh, you can achieve? And how should we arrange the pads? Uh, this is something that we need to investigate uh, first. And uh, this will then lead us to the final solution. Uh, this arrangement of pads is an interesting question because on the right, you can see uh, the human hand and uh, you see that it has this uh, funny shape. Uh, this is because uh, the size of the part of the human hand that corresponds to the receptor density. So you see that there are many more receptors on the fingertips than, for example, on the rest of the finger. So this uh, can have an impact on us. So maybe we should uh, put uh, more pads on the fingertip than the rest of the, of the finger. And uh, this is something or a part of the questions that uh, we uh, investigate uh, right now in, in tactility. And of course, uh, we would like to uh, investigate uh, the quality and quantity of sensations that uh, can be elicited by stimulating the finger. Uh, and I will just give you a brief illustration of uh, some of the tests that we have done. This is the first uh, electrode that uh, we have made in tactility. And obviously, uh, everything that I show here is the work uh, of uh, all the partners in, in tactility or most of the partners, uh, not only obviously uh, of Holborg University, uh, but uh, this is the electrode, the tactility electrode, the first version. And uh, this uh, tactility electrode is uh, placed uh, on the fingertip uh, in this uh, uh, picture here uh, to uh, ensure a tight placement or a, a connection between the electrode and the finger. We place this uh, silicon cuff and then the electrode is below this uh, silicon cuff. The first electrode that uh, we have made uh, comprised uh, eight pads here. Uh, and these uh, eight pads, uh, they are all concentrated on the fingertip. And then the first test that we have done uh, in collaboration with uh, Technalia Serbia, uh, we have uh, asked uh, subjects uh, to uh, feel the sensation when we activate uh, certain pads. And then uh, the subjects uh, should uh, uh, select the grid uh, using the grid on the notepad. They should select uh, where they feel the sensation in response uh, to pad activation. And the subjects uh, could just 
uh, activate uh, cells in this grid to indicate uh, how this uh, sensation uh, spreads around uh, the fingertip. So this is uh, the first assessment uh, for us uh, to see how the sensation is elicited when you activate individual pads. Uh, so this is uh, the grid uh, on the left uh, that, that the subjects were pre presented with, uh, and then you can see the cells now a little bit better than in the previous uh, in the previous slide. And on the right, uh, you see the results uh, that uh, we have obtained. Uh, and actually, these uh, are heat maps showing uh, the rate of uh, selection of different cells uh, when uh, certain pads uh, were activated. And the heat maps are arranged exactly the same as the pads. Uh, and the electrode. So this uh, heat map is uh, for that pad, and this heat map is uh, for this uh, pad here, and, and so on. Uh, the black uh, pads uh, uh, or the black uh, cells here are actually the ones uh, that are most often selected by the subjects. And this is very encouraging results for us because we see that when you activate a certain pad of the electrode, then uh, mostly the sensation is localized, uh, or, or uh, in, in most cases, the sensation is localized just below the active pad. And then, of course, uh, in yellow, you see also that uh, this sensation spreads around the finger. And uh, it is interesting to also see that this uh, spreading of sensation is different uh, depending on the area of the fingertip that uh, you activate. So the most localized sensation is close to the tip of the fingertip, and then uh, it's more spread in the middle and especially in the bottom, in the bottom row. And in the bottom row, you see this uh, particular spreading of sensation that goes somehow longitudinally uh, along the, the, the fingertip. So these are interesting results uh, because they show us that the sensations can be well localized, but uh, they also spread around the fingertip. And it seems that, uh, you know, even this small area of the fingertip has a uh, particular regularities in how these sensations spread, depending on where exactly uh, you stimulate. Then, of course, uh, in the next step, uh, uh, the fingertip uh, is just the beginning. Uh, what is the end uh, goal of uh, tactility project? stimulate full finger. And uh, the next uh, we have made is uh, a couple of electrodes uh, that uh, are actually for the stimulation of the full finger. Uh, here you see a couple of designs. I'm not going to go into details uh, with these different designs, but each design has uh, three uh, areas or, or three parts. And each of these uh, uh, sheets, they go to uh, different aspects of the finger. This is for the fingertip, then uh, for the um, for the medial, uh, for the uh, middle phalange, and also for the proximal uh, phalange. And in this case, uh, for each of these uh, finger uh, aspects, you have uh, six electrode pads uh, that are stimulating that uh, that uh, uh, that part of the of the finger. And then uh, we have placed uh, these electrodes on the subjects, and uh, we have trained them uh, to recognize uh, different pads of the electrode. Uh, this uh, training procedure went uh, through three different uh, steps. First, uh, we familiarize uh, the subjects with the sensation just uh, to show them how it feels when you activate different pads. And then we train them uh, to recognize those pads. And after we train them to recognize the pads uh, for, uh, let's say, 15 minutes, then uh, we ask them uh, to uh, uh, guess uh, which pad is active. So we randomly activate uh, the pads and then we ask the subject, okay, now you should point to us which pad uh, was just activated and you just felt. And we assessed uh, how well they can discriminate or recognize different pads uh, on the fingertip individually, then on the phalanges individually. So we train them on a specific phalange and then we test them on that phalange. And then we also did uh, this test for the full finger when we place uh, 19 different uh, electrodes, uh, electrode pads on the full finger and then we train them and test them how well they, they can recognize the full finger stimulation. And again, uh, the results are quite promising. So uh, the first uh, plot uh, here uh, that you see is the success rate when we ask them to recognize uh, six pads that are placed on the fingertip. And you can see that uh, the subjects uh, can, in this case, uh, 10 subjects, they can reach a high success rate when recognizing individual pads applied on the fingertip, right? Then also uh, a result which uh, was a, a little bit surprising to us, but also encouraging is that uh, when you, um, compare the spatial recognition or discrimination on the fingertip and the phalanges, there is no significant differences. So uh, with these uh, six pads placed on the fingertip, on the middle phalange and the proximal phalange, uh, we actually have a similar success rates, which means that uh, the perception uh, for at least for this electrode is similar uh, throughout the whole finger. 
And then finally, uh, if you ask uh, the subject uh, to recognize not uh, six, but 18 different pads at the same time, randomly activated, then uh, the success rate decreases. Uh, it's 80% uh, uh, for the fingertip only and uh, phalanges uh, similarly, but uh, between 50 and 60% for the full finger. Uh, but again, we have to take into account that this is 18 different pads recognized at the same time. So again, uh, we see this uh, as a quite uh, positive and encouraging result. Uh, and uh, to uh, emphasize the, 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 the result is even, even a bit more, here you see a, a something that we call a confusion matrix. So on the rows uh, in this uh, matrix, uh, you have uh, the activated pads and uh, in the columns uh, is the subject uh, guess. For example, uh, we activate the pad number one and in 66% uh, of cases, uh, the subjects uh, correctly guessed that uh, this was uh, the pad that was active, right? So diagonal here in this confusion matrix tells us uh, how many times the subjects uh, were completely correct, right? They recognized successfully the activated pad. While all these numbers on the side of the column, they are mistakes. And basically what we can see is, of course, uh, and this is very nice, that uh, diagonal is uh, much better. So that means that overall, uh, they had the best result uh, successfully recognizing the pad. And then even when they made mistakes, they uh, remained close to the active pad. So basically only in few cases, uh, we have, for example, mistakes uh, that are far away on a different phalange, right? So if, uh, for example, we activate the pad number two, then uh, in most of the cases, uh, they were correct. If they make a mistake, uh, then basically they say it's pad number one or pad number three, and they rarely go further uh, or further away from, from the active pad. So that's also nice because this is a completely blind test, uh, which means that the subject uh, do not see any mechanical interaction. It's just an electrical stimuli, stimuli. So we can imagine that in virtual reality, this will help calibrating this tactile sensation. So we expect that uh, you are able to localize the active pads or the place of stimulation even, even better or much better when we also complement uh, tactile feedback with visual feedback. So conclusions uh, of, of this uh, short uh, presentations and of our work uh, so far is that uh, we can indeed provide high resolution feedback when stimulating the finger. The stimulation is well localized and uh, we can get a very good uh, spatial discrimination or recognition of these pads by the subjects. Uh, we also notice uh, that there is uh, some dispersion and sometimes uh, they also make uh, mistakes that are further away from the direct neighbors. Uh, so now we are also working on more complex uh, tactile effects. So this is just a static uh, stimuli. Now we will also investigate the uh, moving sensations on the finger. And uh, we are working uh, obviously on integrating those electrodes that I have just uh, shown you, uh, producing new prototypes and integrating the electrodes into the glove because uh, the end result uh, should be the glove with uh, electro tactile pads uh, on the fingertips and the finger and the palm. And then on the other side, we should also have kinematic sensors to fully integrate the glove in the virtual reality. And finally, uh, this will allow us uh, to also integrate these tactile sensations with the visual feedback, uh, which uh, as I commented on the slide before, uh, will uh, provide uh, the full uh, impact and something that uh, we are looking uh, forward to. Thank you very much. This is all. Uh, please uh, ask uh, questions if you have any, either now or, or at the end of the, of the webinar. Thank you. Yes. So Thierry, that's uh, all from me. Yes, thank you, Strahinia, for this uh, nice introduction into electrotactile stimulation with all the history and so on, and also showing the first results that we could obtain in this project. So we will have the question and answer round at the end of the three presentations and move on to our next presenter, uh, Ferran. Now I have a list here. Okay, so you should now be uh, in charge of uh, showing presentation. Yes, we can see your presentation. You are still muted. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so do you hear me well? And you see the, I hope that you see the slides too. Yes. Okay. So I would, I would start. 
Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity of being here and present uh, the work uh, and the context that uh, we've been uh, working in, in the project uh, of tactility regarding um, uh, so VR and, and interactions. Uh, so and again, the, most of the work I'm showing here also would be uh, collaborations uh, with uh, the other partners uh, of, of tactility. Uh, so just a, a brief introduction of myself. So I'm a, I'm a research scientist at INRIA. Uh, so INRIA is a publicly funded research institute in, in France. Uh, so we have like uh, different centers. So eight, eight main centers in France and basically we covered a range, a, a wide range of aspects in uh, computer science and applied mathematics. And I'm coming from a team uh, located in Rennes in the, let's say, the far west of, uh, of France, uh, which are mainly interested on, on VR, so how to use VR uh for 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 different applications uh, so to basically um, are really interested on interaction aspects the multi-sensory integration so how we integrate the multiple uh, stimulation and multiple feedback in, in vr so that's why uh, so tactility it's uh, it's extremely uh, uh, interesting for us and a really exciting um, exciting project uh, so yeah, I just have a brief uh, introduction about VR or basically what we are planning or what we would like to do in, in this project. So here you have a, a kind of a video, a commercial video from a, from a basically a, a demo application from you know this uh, kind of uh, so VR headset, the the, HT, the HTC I know the Valve Index uh, headset in which you can have like some basically basic finger tracking using some controllers. And here, if you can see, so the user can like freely interact with his uh, virtual hand in this uh, VR environment. And, and from the video, everything uh, seems seems great. But most of these interactions are mainly driven by vision. So the user has to mainly rely on his uh, visual information in order to enable such interactions, so, you know, to grasp uh, this handle, uh, to pick uh, this envelope, uh, to tear the envelope to open it. But mostly all of these interactions are based on on, on vision, so the, the user needs to basically to see what is he doing to to uh, to interact this. And so if we go uh, on the on the challenges of VR and why uh, haptics, for example, it uh, would be so important in, in the future. So it's mainly related to this example that I, I'm showing you here. So basically, here you have a user which is basically uh, has like a virtual hand uh, in the in the, in VR, and he wants to use his hand to, to interact with this content. Uh, and of course, uh, we need to somehow track uh, the, the user to be able to know what he's doing uh, in the real life. So in this case, it's really simple. It's just uh, moving his hand um, up and down. And what we notice here is that uh, there are some issues coming, coming in, in the sense that if we transpose uh, what he actually is doing in the real life into the VR environment, so things doesn't work. And somehow we have this kind of, could say kind of glitches, but uh, basically we have this, this interpenetration. And basically, this uh, this uh, this, uh, this in this case, this visual artifact has a number of issues uh, from the interac inter interaction perspective, in the sense that this will uh, discourage to have precise interactions with the with the environment, and also because he has to strongly rely on vision in order to to achieve some some precise task, as the video I show you uh, previously. But also, it has more like high level uh, implications. Uh, basically, mainly on immersion, because somehow this uh, this type of uh, of, of uh, visual feedback has a strong impact. On basically, how real we feel that this experience is, because you know in real life, uh, this doesn't happen. Uh, and also, you can basically lose somehow the faith of this realism of, of this this experience. So this is something that that should be should be avoided. So in order to overcome these issues, and basically this is what you saw uh, in the in the first video. So of course we can apply some uh, some tricks somehow uh, to make sure that uh, you have this consistency between what you see uh, and what you are actually doing. Uh, so, but again, uh, it's relying on on vision, and somehow it's uh, some could say kind of some some of sensory substitution. So we would like to uh, uh, to um, let's say to to. Uh, avoid the issue or the lack of tactile feedback or haptic feedback with this vision. So that's why basically this is why this hand gets blocked uh, with this uh, cube, because that's what we were expecting um, in, in real life. Uh, however, again, so this also adds an additional issue in the sense that when the user is actually uh, in contact with the surface and he's keep going uh, his hand uh, downwards, you can see that the, the hand, the virtual hand is still not moving. So we somehow create some um, 
some separation between what the user is doing and what the user is seeing, which can also have a strong impact on the on the user experience. And of course, there are like plenty of ways. So we would try to tell how to modulate this. So here's an, an example of different ways that we could have uh, to change this visual feedback uh, to maybe to, to elicit uh, a better experiences, but but somehow we are still limited by the fact that we don't have any any tactile or, or physical feedback, and that's why basically the, the main uh, aim of the project is is this one. So basically to enhance uh, such type of interactions, and basically of course there are other technologies that could be used, and here I'm just covering uh, the ones that uh, that basically could take into account the full hand stimulation because that's our goal. So basically to be able to uh, to provide stimulation in the entire hand. So of course, you have uh, two types of, of uh, haptics feedback that you could uh, envision. So, first ones in the in the in the left, you have the ones regarding kinesthetic. Uh, so, this is haptic feedbacks, which ma their main focus is to generate forces. Uh, and the idea is that, of course, you can you could simulate uh, using these uh, these mechanical actuators. So, when there is some contact, so you can block uh, the finger, so the user would won't be able, for example, to trespass a virtual object and maybe to simulate. Uh, some grasping operation, but of course they are somehow clumsy, uh, high consuming power as Strahini also showed some examples in, the, in, in his presentations. And of course we have other type of, of, of uh, systems which do not rely on force, so they are not uh, focusing on generating forces, but focusing on the tactile sense. Uh, basically, the, the second uh, basically um, family of haptic feedback, so we have the kinesthetic and the tactile, and in which uh, tactility also is uh, is placed. So look, focusing on more like this fine sensation that you can generate on the skin rather than uh, uh, basically um, stimulation that we more perceive by the tendons and the muscles uh, in your in your body. And here like two examples of so ones using vibratory uh, feedback, which has the issue of uh, localization, which basically they, they cannot provide uh, basically extremely localized uh, sensations. And another example just for completeness, uh, this one based on, on ultrasound. So basically you can generate some kind of uh, uh, kind of a wind flow or kind of say which are generated by a, re a range of, uh, of, uh, of ultrasound speakers which basically can be used to stimulate uh, different areas in the hand. And this one has the advantage of being no need any any wearable device, but uh, on the contrary, it's limited to where uh, these actuators could uh, basically generate uh, some stimulation. So the goal of, uh, of course, of the project is to go more towards this globe-based approach with this high density in order to be able to elicit uh, a wider range um, uh, of sensations. But of course, uh, all of this has a, a high number of, of challenges uh, because from one side we have this uh, this. Uh, this strong challenge of co-localizing uh, visual and tactile feedback, because what we want uh, is that uh, we want to see something that is going on in the virtual environment, and at the same time, we want uh, a gener the generation of a tactile stimulation, which is co-located, which basically is at the same place uh, in which the user is, is interacting, uh, both temporarily and spatially. So uh, in the haptic, the haptic sense is extremely, uh, in let's say, intolerant to latency. So we'll really perceive uh, that something is uh, is going uh, with uh, triggering too late. So we can maybe feel that we are touching, uh, but then the tactile sense is stimulated later on. So we really see this kind of uh, incongruencies between the visual and the tactile. So this is extremely challenging. Plus, of course, we are aiming to stimulate the entire hand. So basically, it adds an, an additional level of, of, of complexity. And on top of that, and it's also related on what uh, we see on the first slide, that this is this authoring. So, so how to drive this uh, this stimulation in order to generate uh, what we are looking for? So, what type of sensations we want to generate? Or what type of effects? So, what type of tactile information we can actually render efficiently on um, on uh, on the environment? And of course, we are bounded by this uh, action perception look. So, the user is doing something. In this case, tracked using a kinematic glove. Uh, this is generating some some uh, some change in the environment and generating some feedback, and this feedback should be perceived using the electrotactile glove, which should be consistent uh, with what the user with what the user is doing. And and of course, uh, why we want this because uh, this enables this is how uh, let's say humans interact in the daily life with the real objects, and the goal is to transpose all of this um, to VR. 
Uh, okay, so that was kind of the context, basically, to show you uh, basically what, what we are aiming for and what we uh, basically all the challenges involved in this uh, in this project. And now I would like to highlight uh, some of the works, uh, the first work that we've been conducted in order to integrate this technology, so the, te the technology developed uh, by uh, by the other partners uh, in the VR, and basically how to see how we can exploit uh, such technology to, in this case, to improve the the first example. I show it to you. Uh, so let's say the, the concept is, is pretty simple. Uh, so the goal in this case, we are aiming uh, to render contact information. So basically to co-localize when the user is touching a virtual surface. Uh, and the goal was to use the electrotactile uh, to, uh, let's say, to compensate uh, by this interpenetration that I show you at the beginning. Uh, so the idea is, as you remember, when the user is actually touching the, this, uh, this surface, so the idea is that if he keeps going down, he won't have any feedback visual feedback, sorry, uh, because his hand will be attached uh, to the surface because we don't want to have this interpenetration because it's not, a, it's not a desired feature. But however, when the user is in this area, so basically he's interpenetrating, his real hand is interpenetrating the virtual object, the user doesn't have any additional information in the sense that he doesn't know visually what's going on. So the idea is to create this sensory substitution with tactile feedback. So basically when the user is in this area, so the idea is that the modulation of the electrotactile feedback will provide information to the user where it's actually placed in this area. And of course, the goal would be to try to keep the user as close as possible to the proxy to minimize this offset between this virtual representation and his, and his real object. And here you have an example of the setup we use for this experiment, uh, which in fact we could track uh, the hand and we have the, our stimulator with the, uh, with the electrodes. And the goal was to basically to explore and to assess how this technology could be used uh, to enrich and to maybe mitigate these issues regarding the interpenetration. Uh, and also for completeness and also to be to basically to have some baseline to compare with, uh, basically we consider the, let's say the most efficient uh, solution, which is visual in, in, in any case, because with the visual we can ensure that the user has unambiguous information regarding uh, basically this interpenetration. So we uh, pr propose like a simple feedback showing the interpenetration. So basically you have a high, uh, an outline which grows based on the interpenetration. So the higher the interpenetration, the higher the outline. And also so we have different objects with different properties uh, because it's important to us to really understand the role of the visual uh, feedback in such uh, in such type of task. So the goal is to have a fair comparison between electrotactile and um, and, and visual. Uh, so here you have a, a small example of basically how what, how the experiment looked like. So this was kind of a, again a simple experiment, but needed to really uh, answer our research questions. And the task was uh, simple in nature. So the user was informed or was asked to keep. Uh, his finger in contact with a virtual surface for an amount of time. And our goal was to see how the different visual, mod uh, the interpenetration modalities helped to achieve this task. And uh, we asked the users, of course, to try to keep uh, this interpenetration as smaller as possible. So here we could um, precisely assess how the different uh, feedback modalities help uh, to, achieve, uh, to achieve this task. Uh, so here I have a brief uh, summary of, of the results to show you uh, basically that uh, that uh, actually it works and it works even better than, than we expected. Uh, so in this in this figure, what you have is the uh, in the y-axis you have the average interpenetration, which basically is this uh, d uh, value in this figure. So how much uh, the user interpenetrated the surface, and of course zero would mean that the task was perfect. So the user was able to keep his finger really on the top of the surface without any interpenetration at all. And this, uh, this uh, the y-axis is on centimeters. So basically you have 0 0.5, 1 centimeter, 1.5 and 2 centimeters. So in any case, uh, we could see that the user, when there is no feedback at all, but again, so the user have the feedback of the hand. So the, he know when the hand get blocked. So when basically you have like basically the traditional the traditional feedback, we have this uh, interpenetration around 1.2 or 1.25 centimeters, which basically this, uh, this distance. And of course, we ask them to be as precise as possible. So in, under other conditions, this value should rise uh, much more because in this case, the task was extremely focused. But what we can see is that once we add uh, some interpenetration feedback, this value uh, decreases and this difference is significant. So basically we have a, a significant effect 
uh, on the electro tag on the on the feedback. Uh, and here the, the interesting the interesting aspect is that we see like uh, some equally between uh, electro tactile and visual feedback. Uh, so this at once might show you that okay that we are not bringing anything new here, but here we we need to to be uh, to be aware that there are two main issues uh, regarding the uh, the visual feedback. So the first one is that it adds it surcharges uh, the visual modality. So imagine that we are interacting with five fingers and we need to provide individual interpenetration feedback for each of the fingers. So this really will overload uh, a lot uh, the visual modality. And plus, and plus, in order to do this, the user needs to be able to see his finger. So in a case that we have like a blind, uh, a blind interaction, the user will still be able uh, to perform or we expect that the user will be able to to perform even better with um, with electrotactile compared to visual, but of course, uh, this is something to be to be explored in the future. And also, we had the the combined approach. Also, we we found some little enhancement, although the the differences were not significant. Which shows that uh, the electrotactile is a really good candidate uh, for such type of of interactions and will uh, enable uh, much better interactions in the future. So, in general, what we should uh, retain from this experiment. So, the goal is that uh, the the idea is that the, the user were able to actually basically accurately touch, of course, uh, with uh, with quotes, uh, virtual objects. And also, like, uh, this is also a really impor in, important experiment for us because we also assess a bit of this acceptability because this is important for us because at the end we want a product. Or that would be the, the, the ideal outcome of the project, or at least something toward that direction. So users were pretty uh, totally fine using electrotactile feedback and there were no any uh, let's say negative aspects that were elicited during the uh, during the experiment, and also we observed like a fast learning curve. So there was not there was not a lot of training in order to use the system. So users were able to use it in a straightforward way. And finally, and what's important and relates uh, one of the challenges I, I I said at the beginning is regarding latency. So we could observe that the system is able to generate this feedback without noticeable latency. Of course, there will be some latency, and this will be improved in the future, but during the experiment that was not an, an issue and did not uh, decrease the, the user performance. And then just to conclude, you have also some examples on how this could be used for a more, uh, for a different type of interactions, although still uh, we'll be focusing on the fingertips. So with this, we could do more like dynamic interactions. So in the case I show you in the experiment was like a single, uh, an object and a static object. Of course, we can use it also to the user perceives uh, the, the objects, and in this case, we have a user which is pushing two objects with a different weight. So we can also use this uh, to modulate the electrotactile feedback to generate, or maybe to try to elicit some illusions uh, on weight, because of course we are not providing any kinesthetic uh, feedback which will uh, trigger such type of, of illusions. And this is another example, like pushing some uh, some virtual uh, some virtual spring. Although here, what is important to say that the contact is somehow static, so basically the finger gets static on the uh, on the on the surface, and of course, other things could be envisioned also for like the exploration of surfaces based on how we could use the tactile to basically to gather more information uh, for these uh, for these uh, virtual environments. So this is another example of different types of explor exploratory motions. Okay, so that, that concludes my talk. So basically, we try to provide some overall context of uh, of VR and basically what is important to have this tactile feedback there. And I hope that I convince you that electro tactile might be a good a good choice. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you, Ferran. So I do not want to add anything to these uh, closing words. Uh, of course, we are here to hopefully produce some impact. So let's move on to the last part. So this is the part uh, that I uh, invite uh, Martin to show us or to um, uh, describe us a bit uh, the, their experience and uh, demos what they uh, already were doing uh, during the project. Um, I will share or give the share of the screen to, to Martin. So, Martin, you are still muted. Probably you can unmute. Okay, should be good now. Yes. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, can you also see my screen or should I share my screen? Yes, we see your screen. Okay, perfect. Um, I will first give a short introduction. 
So I'm Matt Witteveen. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Manus. Manus is a, a, com a technology company from the Netherlands, and we mostly focus on glove solutions. So bringing hands into different markets. Our main focus is for the motion capture industry, um, VR training and simulation, robotics, medical, and life sciences. So providing a solution for those companies to bring uh, glove interaction into their solutions. So you can think about recording actors so that 3D models and interactions are handled for animations, uh, but also for training uh, personnel in VR um, using hand interactions. Now you will see more um, gloss solutions on the market. Um, Ferran showed some in his presentations for haptic feedback. And one of the uh, unique selling points, one of the visions of Manus is to make everything uh, really small, wearable, comfortable, all the features that make it a nice and uh, well usable glove for those markets. And uh, all of the haptics gloves that are currently available are all either bulky or they are uncomfortable or they add so much hardware that they are um, only useful for a very small uh, niche market. Now, one of the things that is interesting about this the tactility um, uh, project is that it aims to put everything onto foil, everything onto uh, a substrate that is easy to incorporate into the glove where the electronics are also proposed to be really small so that we can make a very nicely wearable product. Um, and that's also our part within this project is to bring this technology to the market into a glove based interface. Um, I will show now a video. Uh, I will turn off the audio. Um, this is the, the first step into bringing this into a glove based interface. So here you will see the electrical stimulator, the electrodes that were discussed in the beginning of this uh, webinar. You will see the glove-based uh, interaction. You will see the VR implementation. You will see the work from India, India for the interaction uh, layer. Um, all those elements combined to bring a first glimpse into what this technology will bring. Um, this, this uses a VR system from, uh, from Valve, the Steam VR tracking. And that gives the position of the hand. So you will see into a unity scene, the hand moving and includes space with here in this case. Um, the moment that he uh, connects with the sphere and as he moves further into the object, the interpenetration, the haptic stimulation, the electrodes will increase in intensity, indicating that he has moved further into the object and that he's interacting with the object. Um, and the moment, of course, that he lets go of the object, he leaves the interaction sphere, that the electrode stimulation immediately stops. Um, and this, uh, this has the potency of, of solving one of the big issues that we currently have with our haptics technology, is that we have a lot of people that, when they want to grasp for an object, they just grasp entirely through it. So they make an absolute fist on the object. And um, what would be nice if we can uh, get that to work is that they have a more realistic sense of that the object is actually there in that space and their hand also mimics the movement derived from uh, from interacting with those objects. Um, so this was a first glimpse. Uh, it's it's on the YouTube channel. So if you want to look through it more uh, more clearly, then uh, you, you can visit that. Um, and I would, um, seeing as we're also pressed for time, I would like to open the floor if we have questions or things, uh, things one and those, we can gear that more towards uh, the interest of the audience. Okay, thank you, Martin. Um, maybe you want also to say one or two words uh, uh, regarding um, what you can see here that is the, let me see if I can share. Do you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. If you full screen it, then it should yes, be good. Yes, like this. Huh? Um, yeah, I can, I can uh, explain this real quickly. So um, we, uh, in the demo, you saw a Black Loft. That was our Prime One product that we released in 2019. And this is our 
uh, late 2020 model that is currently available. Um, and that will be used as a sort of platform for this tactility research. Uh, the nice thing about this, I mean, everybody's hindered by COVID. Um, and that's something we need to design for. So one of the nice things for this is that it's completely washable. So once we integrate the technology, um, you will be able to use this glove, wash it, share it between users. That's all no problem. And it has a nice mounting system on it, uh, which is described on the website. You can see it and there. We can click on different types of tracking systems, different type of modules. So that could also be a nice integration with the Technalia hardware that will uh, come later. 